You're listening to the Nerd to Know Media Network. Join us at nerdtoknowmedia.com. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it's now time for our main event. Take a trip back in time to the golden era of the wrestling world with your host, Chris Tetrold Blaine. Welcome to Once Upon a Turnbuckle. Hi everyone and welcome to another new episode of Once Upon a Turnbuckle and I'm so pleased to have yet another um, writer in the midst again this is becoming a little bit of a trend in sort of this batch of episodes I've been doing recently but I'm absolutely loving this realm I'm going into uh, where I can marry both of my loves together in one podcast with writing and wrestling and um, I welcome along I think Saying wrestling writer probably doesn't do this guy justice. Um, his name may well be recognisable to many of you out there. Um, he even spent his time, which we will delve into, obviously, writing for the WWE, of all people. But also writer of this absolute gem here, Blood and Fire. I welcome to the show, Brian Solomon. How are you, mate? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for the great introduction. And thanks for having me on your show. No, no problem at all. No worries at all. I am... Um, we were just having a chat, you know, about you know a, a couple of things. We know we're going to delve into your new book. I have just read it myself; absolutely loved it. Um, and it's great for me having just read it. It's all really fresh up here, and there's so much out of all the books that I've read. I think this one has probably more questions already going through my head. Um, so it's, it's fantastic to get to talk to you about it. But um, I mean, really looking at what you've done we've got so many different directions we can go on but what i like to do to begin with is just kind of let's set the groundwork um you're obviously you're known for your writing within the wrestling world where did your your writing start and which came first wrestling or writing first of all wrestling came first i mean i always tell people that i would be a professional writer with or without wrestling and that's true i mean that's my field the first things that i was paid to write was not wrestling. I used to work for, a, when I got out of college, I worked for a reference book publisher called H.W. Wilson in the late 90s. They were really big, especially before the internet really took off. They were they used to help to categorize and catalog periodicals for students and things okay. like that. It was very dry stuff. But I mean, but I was, but I always loved wrestling and I actually was writing about wrestling even going back to college on like college newspapers, neighborhood newspapers, but I, w I wasn't doing it professionally, you know, mm. but I was a fan from when I was 12 years old. And so when I wanted to be a writer, initially it was actually wrestling that I really wanted to write about. But when, when I didn't think that was going to work out and I was trying to keep my feet on the ground and be practical and everything, mm. I got into a quote unquote normal job. And then I suddenly wound myself pulled in. I, I found myself pulled into the world of wrestling almost accidentally a couple of years later. It was just like a happy coincidence. <laughs> so when you got into wrestling, what sort of era are we talking about here? Not to not to sort of you know, I'm not going to get you to divulge age or anything like that. But what, what was, I don't care. Which okay, fine. Which which year? Which era are we talking about that you you first sort of got hooked in? When I first got really attached to wrestling to, and like interested and watching it, because I mean, like I grew up in the 80s. So like any kids back then, like you knew about wrestling because the mm -hmm. WWF was exploding. Kids talking about it at school. Even any even if you weren't a fan, everybody knew, you know, Hulk yeah. Hogan and WrestleMania, Roddy Piper and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. King Kong Bundy. But it was the when I got hooked in was the build for WrestleMania three in 1987. Okay. Yeah. which is, I always say this, but it's like a very, I feel like it's a very bland answer because that's like, that made millions of fans, I think, at the same mm -hmm. time. Like that whole, like Andre the Giant turning on Hulk Hogan and yeah. the drama of that. And if you're of the right age, it was like 
because I don't think that there's ever been a time in my life that I thought wrestling was quote unquote real, that I thought it was like a real competition. And then okay. I became disillusioned. I never went through that. I always saw it as a show and I didn't understand the nuts and bolts of how it worked. I thought maybe parts of it were real and parts of it were scripted. Mm. You know, I always had my theories like every kid did, especially before the internet. But um, I just got hooked into the drama of the whole Hogan Andre thing. And then, you know, I was off with Randy Savage, Ricky Steamboat. Yeah. You know, I was into all that stuff. That was a formative year for me, 87, 88. That's really when I like cemented my wrestling fandom. I did, you're probably right as well. That That is where so many wrestling fans yes. around that era started. I uh, I was a little bit, I was like three years old at that point. I didn't even know about wrestling until sort of 1990. 91 i really started um so i i wouldn't say i knew hulk hogan to begin with but he was definitely the one by that point who who was the most recognizable and you know i think you saw even then that the the industry was being built around him now um, um judging if, if i may prejudge you by your accent i'm going to assume that you grew up in the uk would that be a correct assumption it is it is yeah it's where i'm where I'm still here today. Yes. Well, the reason that I say that is because it, it's an interesting case to me, because as you probably know, uh, I mean, the UK had its own very rich kind of local national mm. wrestling history way before. But then you had the WWF that came like at the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s. It was that huge boom. Mm. And so now you kind of have people like you who grew up in that world and yeah. so the wrestling that you know and that you love is that wwf wrestling yeah. like i remember having a conversation with tyler Bate, who you know was the uk wwe yes. NXT uk champion and i interviewed him like right after he won the belt and i forgot for a second how young he was <laughs> <laughs> this was like when he first won the belt so he was like 19 yeah and i was like you know i'm thinking like oh we're gonna talk about world of sport and all this stuff <laughs> And he's like, you know what? I heard about that from the old timers. But like, you got to understand, like I was born during the attitude era. Yeah. Born during yeah. the attitude that, era. That's the sort that makes me feel a bit old because right. that's, yeah, I was well into it at that <laughs> point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I World of sport, it's, it's, I, so when I was growing up, you're right. The first wrestling that I knew of was obviously WWF. Within a year or two, I, I realized there was a second one out there. You know, WCW sort of took my um, attention as well. Um, I knew there was British wrestling. I had heard people refer to Big, Big Daddy and Giant Haystacks. This is so cliche. Right. I didn't really know about World of Sport properly until I started this podcast. Um, and I started delving into it then. I, I interviewed Marty Jones. Mm. Um, I, spent, I think it was last year. And I mean, he's a guy, if ever you wanted to, if like me, you knew nothing about it. You just needed to talk to him. You know, he could tell you absolutely everything, having been amongst it. And I think where I am now, where I grew up in the 90s, the 80s and 90s is my favorite era. But as I'm getting older and I'm reading books like yours, I am now almost like going back in time to learn more and relive stuff that had already gone past by the time that I realized what wrestling even was. That's what I did too, because like people always say to me, like, how old are you? I don't understand. Like why you weren't even there when the Sheik was, was really big. And they're right. I mean, I wasn't even, most of this book takes place before I was even born, mm. but I got it into my head. Excuse me. Like after those first few years of being a fan as a kid, when I started getting a little older, like going into the nineties, high school, college years, I started to get fascinated by wrestling history at that time from the magazines and going yeah. like, Oh my God, there was like this whole history to this. And I would hear some of my family members talk. Like my grandfather would talk about Bruno San Martino and my mm -hmm. dad would talk about buddy Rogers and things like that. And I started going, wow, this is really interesting because they never talk about this on TV. So I want to learn about it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got so deeply into, you know, trying to learn um, all the history and everything. And like, but the UK history is something that, even I'm very fuzzy on. I would love yeah. to learn and see more. You know, there's a there's an app. There's the BritBox app, which I don't know if it's available over there. It is. But it's available yeah, here. Yeah. And I'm such a nerd because I love that. I love it. And I'll go and I'll watch because there was a lot of British television, BBC and ITV stuff that was available here on public television. Okay. It would come here to PBS, but it was only like the biggest, most popular 
things like Doctor Who and yeah. Monty Python and, you know, all creatures great and small, like the shows that were really, really big. Yeah. But I'm such a geek. I'm just like, oh, I wish I wish they would put World of Sport on the Brit box, which amazing. they'll never do in a million years, I don't think. But no. they own it. They have it. I believe they own all that stuff. It was I ITV. I think, yeah, yeah, ITV with ones that did it. And they tried relaunching it. Um, or, you know, yeah. the old show here a few years ago. I, I didn't manage to catch that. I must admit, I'll lay, I'll lay this down like I do with a lot of my guests. I, I'm not a follower of the current stuff at all. I haven't regularly watched wrestling till, since about 2000, 2001. I keep I've kept up with it. Right. I kind of know what's going on, but um, unless it was something that had come from that time that I wanted to go back to, I I, I sort of gave it a wide berth. Um, maybe I've missed out on something that I don't know. Maybe I'll try and catch it another day. But um, yeah, anyway, with the sort of obviously before the time of the internet and social media and everything, how difficult or was it easy for you to? to to get all this knowledge and go back and discover all this history. For it was very, it was very difficult, honestly, mm. because all I had to go by, because not only was it pre-internet, but I was also very young and I wasn't as savvy about media and stuff. And so like, it was a combination of things. It was the wrestling magazines that would occasionally publish like historical articles and photos and things. And I would eat it up. Like I remember there was the, the 25th anniversary of the wrestler magazine, which came out and that issue came out in the summer of 91. And that was just life changing. I mean, I'm not even exaggerating because that's what started the whole like obsession with wrestling history, stuff like that. And then when I got to college again, I'm just such a weirdo is that when I got my hands on the microfilm machines, if people remember what that even was, where you would have <laughs> it would be microfilm tape or like films of yeah. newspapers. So they would literally yeah. take a picture of every page of the newspaper and store it on this film for posterity. Mm. And you could look at anything. And I would go in the college library, Brooklyn College, and I would look up the New York Times from May of, I guess it was 1908, to find the article about when, when Frank Gotch beat George Hackenschmidt for the, the world heavyweight yeah, title. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It's like stuff yeah. like that. I, I, would, I would eat that up because you couldn't find it anywhere else. And I would sit there going like, it's real. It really happened, <laughs> you know, because there's no internet and I'm looking at it, like reading it in detail. Now, when the internet first hit, which was like mid night, like the first time I remember really using it a lot would be about 95. And it was again in the library or if I had, or I would go to these things we had called internet cafes. Oh yeah. One or two of them still knocking around. Yeah. But I would, I would become obsessed because there was this explosion of information all of a sudden. And I remember one of the first sites that I latched onto, it's actually still in existence. It's, it's the Pura Resu Dojo. Do you know that, that website? It, it's, um, it's also known as wrestling dash titles.com. And I'm sorry if I'm screwing up the, I may well, yeah. The great, the great Hisa is the name of the guy that runs it. Okay. A Japanese guy. And, it's still around to this day. You're talking at this point, like almost 30 years. And right. this guy on there, he has every title history known to man cataloged in detail. Right. And my, you know, my eyes were popping out. And back then I'm, I'm just in such an analog mindset. I'm over there like printing everything out, you know, like it's going to go away. I, I'm printing out all the title histories, like a maniac, oh. <laughs> the pages, <laughs> flying out like the librarians coming over like what, what are you doing <laughs> Every, you know i'm like it's like the florida tag team titles yeah I'm printing it all out you know to have for reference because all of a sudden it's all there you know yeah. it was it was like a it was a renaissance yeah that's what it was that's cool yeah i think i i do i must have landed on that site once or twice because i i'm a bit like that but when it really took off for me history wise uh, it's about 95, 96. I had that year's um, PWI Wrestling Almanac that they, I don't know if they still do them. No, um, they stopped finally. They did, did it they? for a good, uh, they did it for maybe like, oh, they stopped about 10 years ago, maybe like seven or eight years ago. Right. 
They yeah. just felt like it was becoming obsolete, you know. Okay, but this this day ended up so dog-eared and tattered because oh, yes. I literally read it cover to cover. All of the results, all the again title histories for the major titles and everything in there, and that that really was where I kind of made the link between what I was watching then and what I'd watched for about five six years to everything else that was out there that I didn't know anything about. When they first announced that they were coming out with an almanac. I lost my mind. Like I was waiting for it. Like, you know, it was Christmas. I couldn't yeah. believe it because it was all this stuff. It was all going to be collected in one place, which yeah. didn't exist before. And I have to say, and I work with the, with PWI now, and I know, I know Kevin McIlvaney, the editor, and he loves yeah. me. I love him. I'm going to say one thing. And I, I mean, he would probably agree with me. I always felt as the years went on and there was more and more info that they had to try to cram in there, you know, with the title history. Yeah. And I felt like, I enjoyed the almanacs less and less over the years because they started cutting out some of the older content to make room. And the worst part was there was almost no photography after a certain point because they had no room because so, I loved the old photos in there, especially yeah. that that first one. I mean, the pictures, the just ancient photographs in there. Yeah, I, I ate it up. And, and so it became less interesting to me as it went along. Yeah, I can totally get that. And like I say, that was the only edition of it that I had. I didn't really, mm. I don't know if they released too many more over here in the UK. I certainly didn't see them the rest of the years I was sort of collecting. They did it um, every year here for from like 96 to maybe like 2016 or something like that. Maybe that, that was the first one. Yeah, it was around about 96. So maybe that was the first one. Maybe that was why I thought it was so special because it literally started yeah, all the way back then. I've been looking for uh, copies of it on eBay. It's obscene amount of money it's going for, so unfortunately. I'm sure. And I don't have mine anymore either. I don't know what I was thinking. I was just an idiot. Why would you get rid of that? I, I have one. I think I have the I have one from the late nineties, but it's it's not quite as good. The the ninety six one is the one it had like the, a belt on the cover. Yes. With like the globe. It didn't have any photos of anybody. No, that was it. That's the one. Right. That's that the was one. the first one. Yeah. That's probably why then it's yeah, yeah it's mm -hmm. but brings me on nicely actually to to the next point that I obviously wanted to cover. Um, one of the yeah being in the UK, I didn't get um, access to much wrestling on TV at all, probably till about ninety five ninety six. So my main source of knowledge came from magazines. I had what I thought was the world's biggest wrestling magazine collection. Of course, it probably wasn't um, <laughs> back then. You, um, you actually, you were one of the writers, if not editor at some point of the WF magazine between, am I getting this right, early 2000s? Yes, I was a writer and editor at WWE for their publications department, which was their magazines from February 2000 to May 2007. Oh, that's, a, that's quite an interesting, even though a lot of those years I wasn't really, I wasn't watching it regularly 2000 2001 i still was and um so obviously the kind of change that you've seen working you know from within during that time i think the most obvious thing i wanted to ask you about really as well as you know we'll circle back into how you got into this but yeah. one of the most the, the the point at which wrestling changed for me was when wcw uh disappeared um from an insider's point of view then when that was going on you know what was that like for you you know was there were you fearful almost of what that might do to the industry or was it exciting because you had all of this you know all this like drama to write about almost it was it was very exciting because it was something that i don't think we saw coming if i'm remembering it right now we had a the president at the time his name the president of wwf at the time was his name was Stuart Snyder. And he was the guy that sort of brokered this deal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it had been in the works behind the scenes, but we didn't know about it. And all I remember is all of a sudden, there was an all staff email that went out. And it just said, uh, WWF Entertainment Incorporated has come to terms for the purchase of the uh, all the assets of World Championship Wrestling Incorporated, effective immediately, blah, blah, blah. And we're just sitting there like, you know, what? Am I, am I reading this right? What? What? They just dropped it in our laps. 
and you know and then we were off with the whole thing of like what they did on television with it i mean we were pretty in the dark in the beginning going where is this all headed because i was there right towards the end of the monday night wars and it was a real thing where it was like week Mm. to week what are they doing even though like wwf was handily winning by that point but this was the time when vince russo had jumped over and we didn't honestly know where that was going to lead if it was going to be a a difference maker or whatever. So, you know, I, it was exciting, honestly, like we didn't realize at first, I didn't what I feel anyway, the harm that that would do in having only one major company. But let me tell you something. We started to feel it right away. Like, like within a year of that, we started going like, what are we doing now? What, you know, like I I was never a fan of the brand extension. I thought it was a terrible idea from the beginning. But it was a result of that, of saying like, well, we have no more competition. What are we going to do? Make our own. And I'm going, well, well, no one's going to buy this. Nobody cares about TV shows. I mean, everybody knows it's one company. Yeah. Nobody thinks of it as a brand. You you know, what what is this? So I I hated that idea from the start. But but it was an exciting time to be there. It, it, It definitely was that. Cool. I um uh, like I say I I felt everyone's got their opinions of this, and I I would love to know yours. Did they do it right, or could they have done a lot more with with what they had there with the invasion and and things well, like that? Well, not they ruined it. I mean they they That's they good. took <laughs> they took the greatest hail mary pass, fantastic um you know thing dropped in your lap in wrestling history, and completely ruined it i mean i i even wrote an article about it recently for inside the ropes magazine talking about because it's you know the 20th anniversary of the invasion storyline and just yeah. how this dream angle that people had been fantasizing about for you know a decade or more honestly uh, even going back to the crockett days if you yeah. wanted to um it just turned into something where you were like you know i maybe i never really wanted this this is not what i what i pictured it would be no. what is this mark jindrak and yeah. you just john didn't o'hare have, running you didn't around have they didn't have the stars that we all dream no. we would have when when it happened it was a lot of things they didn't get the stars at first because a lot of them were being paid still to stay home so there's no flair there's no goldberg there's no nwo hall nash there's no hogan there's you know there's no uh i, I mean even DDP, it took a while for him to show up. Yeah. So in the beginning, it's like, okay, we got Booker T, which great. I mean, he was the world champion and yeah. everything, but it wasn't what people wanted. Oh, there was no Scott Steiner. I mean, these people started trickling out later when yeah. they needed money. And, and it yeah. was becoming, it was too too little too late. Uh, yeah. And you had too many, you had the, then there was the idea and we realized it right off from the beginning. And you could tell even from the inside that they were never going to treat WCW as an equal foe. They just, they could not swallow their pride to do that. So they had to bury them right from the start and they lost faith in it so quickly. Yeah. And yeah, it didn't help that horrendous uh, Buff Bagwell match on television. That was notorious yeah. for sort of killing Vince's, you know, kind of hopes for what it could be. But I mean, you have to have a little patience. They weren't willing to treat them like an equal and they sabotaged the story, which is so dumb when you think about it because yeah. you own it now. It's not yeah, like it's exactly. not like you're giving them anything. No. I mean, you could even have them win and it wouldn't even matter. You own no. them. You know, yeah. how dumb can you be? You know, yeah. and then they brought ECW into it and it only got worse. It got yeah. worse. Yeah, I mean, if they you, you talk about back in the the eighties, you know, saying that WWF killed the territory, the whole you know the territory yes. days, they did it all again. You know, <laughs> even when there was like a big three, they they couldn't. Let, but anyway, I'm going down my rabbit hole here. I could talk about this for ages. I just I feel yeah, like a lot. There was a, a huge missed opportunity there where we could have, as fans, we could have really invested, even if they kept them separate. For well, a you bit. knew. You knew. I remember the, they were talking in the beginning, internally. The creative decisions were they wanted to have WCW continue as its own show, mm. and they wanted to keep it going. In fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, there was talk of trying to keep it on the Turner Networks, right? But the Turner Networks wanted nothing to do with it, 
and uh, because that was the whole reason they got rid of it was they didn't yeah. want it on their TV. Yeah. So they were running into this issue where like, okay, we want to create a WCW show. And that's why they came up with a new logo. They were going to do, they were going to run it separately and then have them interact with each other. Yeah. And I think what happened was um, I think it came down to the networks. Like, I think it was like USA network or whoever had them on at the time, if it was spike or whatever, they were kind of like, we don't want that. We're not what it was. No. WCW, like they, they suck. They're the company you just beat. We're, we're not putting that on our, you know. So they had nowhere to put the show on. Mm -hmm. It's funny to think if they had the network, the WWE network back then, maybe they could have tried it and yeah. had a WCW show. But that's why they very quickly said, okay, we can't run them as two leagues. So we're just going to have to have the WCW guys invading Raw yeah. right from the beginning. And it sort of was doomed right from the start, you it know. Was. This is sad. This is sad. Yeah. There you go. You can't go back and rewrite history, or can you? Um, <laughs> if you can, you're the right guy to do it. Anyway, just very, very quickly, um, your your time with um, WWF, WWE. How how did that begin? Kind of going back to the beginning there. What were you doing at the time when that opportunity came up? Well, I was writing for that very dry reference publisher that I mentioned to you. Yeah. I'd been there for about three years and I was newly married. So I was trying to be, you know, again, very responsible. And one of the things about when I was married, I'm looking, I started looking for another job, a better job. And, you know, it's the most mundane thing in the world. My wife, this is back in the days of going through the New York times classifieds, like on paper, the paper newspaper yeah. classified ads. My wife goes, Hey, look at this. She points to it in the middle of the classified section of the New York Times, which is just rows and rows of tiny little text, there's the giant WWF scratch logo. And I'm going, this has to be a joke or something. <laughs> what is this? And, and they were looking for a copy editor, which is like a proofreader. Part of this, what I didn't know at the time was because of Vince Russo leaving and taking some people with him. It had shaken some things up on the publication side and even on the creative services side. And they were looking for some new people to bring in. And so I initially interviewed for that. Now, my background was not in copy editing. I'd never proofread anything in my life. I was a writer. And the only proofreading I understood was from other editors proofreading my own work. Yeah. So I sort of like faked it till I made it kind of thing where I just got my foot in the door. They brought me in for three different interviews between October 99 and like January 2000 to the okay. point where... I had given up on it. And in fact, I think they hired someone ahead of me, but then they discovered they needed a second one. And thankfully for that reason, I got it, Gee. but they, I gave up. And then I remember, I think it was, they called me. It might've been like the day before new year's Eve or something uh, and saying, Oh, we want you to come in again after the holidays. And I came a second time. And then what the funny thing was when I came the second time, I thought, I was, I acted too much like a fan. Like I, I don't want to think I'm some crazy fan. No, no, no. It was the opposite. It was the opposite. I didn't want to come off like a crazy fan. So I was very low key. Yeah. I didn't talk a lot about how, you know, they were like, w are you a wrestling fan? And I'm like <laughs> biting my lip and I just go like, eh, you know, I'm, I'm aware <laughs> of it. And I'm thinking like, why are you doing this? And I got so, I thinking I shot myself in the foot. I actually called HR back and I said, could I have a do over? Cause I really think I didn't really let you know everything about myself. They brought me back again wow. three times from, and, and then back in those days, I was living in New York city driving up to Stanford, which is like, uh, you know, it's like a 75 mile drive or something like, I don't know if you know what miles are. Do you guys have? Yeah, miles? we do. Yeah. At least I do. do. All right. We're the only ones, right? Yeah, We're the probably. only ones hanging on to that, that in the English <laughs> language. We have that's, those that's all things. like, that's the only way I can visualize it. Right. So, so yeah. set about 75 miles, it was about a, with traffic and everything, like a two hour drive. And I did that a few times. And, you know, I'm at the time, it was very surreal because I'm going like, this is almost like somebody writing the script of a movie sort of like, because for someone like me who is absorbed in this stuff for so long to wind up here, even just to be interviewing here yeah. is like, this is too weird to really be happening. How is this really even happening? Especially because I wasn't actively like pursuing it anymore. I, I had sort sure. of moved on with my life and now it was in front of me like this. And then I wound up getting the job. Like I just, it was, it, it didn't even feel like reality at no. first. It's 
crazy. Yeah. That's amazing. Is Titan Towers the first time you see it? Is it a bit like one of those kind of like, wow, or inspiring kind of things? Or, or does it not live up to expectations? Well, not to come off as the arrogant New Yorker, but I am from New York City. So, you know, I mean, like compared to the Empire State Building and sure. the Twin Towers and the Chrysler <laughs> Building and, you know, Rockefeller Center. No, it's not. What, what it is is a giant glass box right off of the Interstate 95 yeah. in Connecticut, which everybody that goes up and down that highway knows because it's a giant glass building. It's, it's literally just a box, yeah. a glass box. It's about four stories high, four floors, and it has a, an American flag and a WWE flag, yeah. which for years were of equal size, which caused quite a controversy because you're not supposed <laughs> to do that here. When you fly a flag next to the American flag, it can't be the same size. So oh, okay. Yeah. But anybody that drives by knows that building. Sure. But I mean, you know, but it, it is in a weirdly um, suburban area, which when I went there first and any other time I've had to take people there, they're really caught off guard. People don't realize the building is on a corner and the rest of the houses, the rest of the buildings are just like little residential dwellings. Like if wow. you go around the corner past the loading dock, it's just somebody's house with a backyard and not even like a very impressive house. Like they could throw a ball easily and hit the side of the Titan tower building. Wow. And it's just house after house down the rest of the block. So it's not like it's in the middle of some metropolis. It's no. not, it's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. That's insane. I, I think a few years ago, I, I almost wanted to experience it. It's not, I, I haven't got to America yet. Um, and it's probably not one of the places my wife would be too intrigued to go and see. So I thought I'm going to drop myself into Google Earth to find out where it is and drop myself in like Street View. So I was like going down the, yes. the highway, whatever it is that you call it. And then it appeared. Yeah. So, so I remember when I was there and this is one of the funny things when you work there and you see it from the inside. Um, there was at that time, the Japanese magazine Weekly Gong was still in operation. I think it was Weekly Gong. And we used to get it there in the office. If it wasn't Weekly Gong, it was some other prominent Japanese wrestling magazine. And we couldn't read Japanese. But there was an entire spread in this one issue where two of the writers, these two Japanese guys, for whatever reason, they were in the United States. I couldn't read it, so I didn't really understand. the. I was trying to understand the context of it. They mm -hmm. came here, and one of the things they did was they made a pilgrimage to Titan Tower in Stamford. And I'm, I'm looking and we're all looking and we're kind of laughing because it's like, this is just our job where we go to work. <laughs> and there are these two Japanese tourists and there's pictures of them everywhere. They're standing in front of the building. They're standing in front of the McDonald's across the street. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, there's where I get my hair cut, like, like on the other side of the street. Just to, to us, it's just like, oh, this is just a street yeah. in Stanford. And these people came from the other side of the planet to take pictures of themselves <laughs> in front of all this boring everyday stuff to us, you know? That's how not make you feel special. Hilarious. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Right. Anyway, let's move on to this guy right here. So oh, I know that. Book. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure I thought you might be familiar with it. The unbelievable real life story of wrestling's original Sheik. Okay. My experience with the Sheik didn't have any. Um, I remember, but I still knew who he was. Um, I didn't really watch any of his matches. This really rings true after reading this book, by the way. This is the only reason I'm saying it. Um, one of the earliest times I remember ever seeing or reading about the sheet was it must have been in a, a, an episode of PWI or uh, whatever, some of the other more sort of independent wrestling magazines I was reading back then. It's a full page picture of the sheet. I'm pretty sure it was either Bobo Brazil or Abdullah the Butcher. Um, and it was just carnage. There was just they were. I think the sheik was was on top of him on the ropes. He was stabbed, and it was something I couldn't um, I, I couldn't identify at the time. Blood everywhere. He did freak me out because yes. he he looked like he was a, a an older guy as well. And I thought, who is this? What is he doing? Why is this happening? When yes. I'm used to seeing whatever WWF were doing, that really stuck with me. So me when I've gone Very through similar. all all these years, I've I've. I've never really learned much about the Sheik at all. And I will say of your book, the one thing that I would, you know, after reading it, that kept going over my head is this is one of those wrestling stories I never knew I needed to know until I read your book. 
Thank you. Because I had no idea that this guy's story was like it was and how he actually, I mean, you talk about someone living their character and their persona. I mean, this, he, he never let it go. And you see the pitfalls and you see the, the um, successes of doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that sort of thing about him is also what made me fascinated mm-hmm. in him, even as a young fan, when he was an old man and winding down his career, you'd see the pictures like that. I, I, I wonder if I saw the same thing as you. There was an article they ran once where it was a crazy picture of Sheik and Abdullah talking about how, or Brazil, talking about how they're still wrestling each other all these years later. They're still yeah. causing carnage and mayhem. And the, and the impression I got was this guy doesn't, realize that this is not supposed to be real like as a teenager i'm looking at it going like i think this guy might be real i I think maybe this guy is so crazy that he doesn't understand that it's not real Mm so-called and he's really doing this and you know also the in that wrestler issue i mentioned to you from Mm -hmm. 91 there was a famous picture from the early 70s of the los angeles referee uh johnny red shoes dugan who had half of his face burned and yeah. it was supposedly from a match with Sheik with a fireball, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm looking at the picture and his face is all messed up. And I, I found out years later how I think they did it. And I included that in the book. But yeah. again, I'm looking at it going, this is not, you know, this is yeah. not fake. What am I looking at right here? Like somebody explained this part of wrestling. <laughs> to me. What is this guy? Yeah. And that's why when, when I interviewed Terry Funk for the book, he gave me a line which was so good that I had to pull it out and make it the opening quote of the whole book, mm-hmm. which is where he says, uh, people say that wrestling isn't real. Well, somebody forgot to tell this son of a bitch. <laughs> and when he said that, I go, oh, well, that just sums the whole damn thing up. And That's this great. is Terry Funk saying it. It's not just some fan, you know. Right. It's, this was somebody who was in there with him yeah. many, many times. and But that that's what sums him up. It was like that. He was of his time. I don't think you could pull it off today, what he did. He was of that time where there was still a lot of mystery. Mm. So it left people wondering, what is going on when this Mm. guy comes out? What is he like this? What is he doing? Mm. Help me understand. (laughs) And that that kind of mystery kept his career going for years. Yeah. Yeah. And I... I knew he had been around for a long time because by the time I discovered him, like I say, he was he was in his later years then. But it wasn't again really till I read your book that I realised when he started. And you're talking about a guy that started in like the late forties, wrestling yes. through the fifties, and it's it's uh, that's unfathomable to me because I, I didn't even realise wrestling went back that far when I was younger. <laughs> you know, um, so to talk about you know how the book began at what point you know you, you touched on your fascination with him then growing up but at what point did you not only realize you wanted to write this but why the world needed to know his story it was kind of a gradual thing over time so like the more I became interested in wrestling history another thing that would happen is I would try to learn about all the different territories and one that always fascinated me was Detroit mm-hmm. and by extension Toronto but mainly Detroit because I remember thinking to my understanding like it was a very hot territory. There were a couple of years where you could make a case where that it was the hottest in the country. Mm. And the Kobo Arena shows were even, you know, just as big, if not bigger than the Madison Square Garden shows for a little while. Mm. And, and then it just died. It just fell off the map and died. And it was hardly ever talked about anymore, especially outside of the area. I mean, you're still going to find people in Michigan, Ohio, Ontario mm. that, you know, we'll talk and remember fondly everything, but for everybody else, it seemed to have faded quite a bit. You know, you hear about mid South, you hear about Florida and the Texas territories and, you know, and Canada and, and, and Stu hard and all yeah. these things. And, you know, obviously mid Atlantic and Georgia, but yeah, even St. Louis you would hear, but like Detroit was almost a forgotten territory, but not, not one that had been obscure. You could understand a forgotten territory that was never that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. but it was a forgotten territory that had been huge. And I became fascinated with it from that point of view. Yeah. Then as I started to write about wrestling, like I wrote a book in 20, that came out in 2015 called pro wrestling FAQ, which I don't see behind you there right now. I just want to mention that, but (laughs) it was a general kind of reference book. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a profile of the Sheik for the book. 
And that really became the, the early template for the book. I wrote like a, like a, you know, a couple of thousand words about his life and his career. Mm. And I started going, I, I think there's a book here. Like, I, I think if I want to do a biography at some point, this mm. is the one because no one has touched it. There's never been anything. And I can't think of another star of his magnitude um, that has never had a book done about him. I can't mm. name one. I mean, there are people but they're lesser stars than he was, in yeah. my opinion, especially from his time period. There's yeah. nobody at his level that has that had never had a book done. And I just yeah. thought, OK, while there's still people to talk to, I got to do this thing. And, and that became my book. And that brings me on to the next bit, the challenge then of telling a story of someone who was so private. And so almost like, you know, he was his character, his character was him. It's very different, very difficult to know, you know, where, where the lines uh, were drawn, but, you know, you didn't have probably, I'm guessing a lot of uh, close material to go from, you know, personal stories, you, uh, you, you getting through to any of the family must've been a, a bit of a challenge by that point as well. You know, yeah, talk us through that. How you, how do you put together a story like this with all of those limitations in there? Well, I've, I've talked about how it was almost like archaeology because you can't, uh, you know, with a lot of books like this, uh, uh, pretty much everything is gotten by talking to people, you know, or most of it is. And that just couldn't be the case with this, partly because the best people are gone, mm -hmm. most of them, almost all of them. And also because, um, you know, he never gave any interviews. There's nothing you can look back on, not even in character nothing uh the closest thing i found was there was jim friedman's uh book uh, drawing heat from the late 1980s where he actually spoke extensively with the sheik and there's a lot of quotes from him in there that he supposed things he supposedly said to jim right. because jim was on the road traveling with him that book was a gold mine so that that was one thing that's pretty much the only thing and when i talked to the uh wrestl japanese wrestling historian fumi saito he told me that he had done an interview with the Sheik in the 90s when he was in FMW. He, the tape was unusable, but he remembered some things that the Sheik had told him. Okay. That was all I had directly from him. And it wasn't even him. I, I just had to go by, I had to trust these other people that this is what he said, you know? Yeah. Other than that, it was like just trying to piece a narrative together like it took me months and months and months before I even had an outline because mm -hmm. I'm going like what's the theme I don't want this book to just be a list of things that happened yeah. like what is the story and I started collecting you know all these records military records birth death going into ancestry.com finding out where his family came from and the census reports here in the U.S. from yeah. the, the, when he was a kid and you know, the wrestling stuff, again, it was more like going, you know, because the, the results sites that are out there, they're very incomplete when you go back before, like, let's say 20, 30 years ago. Very. Yeah. Okay. So I had to, like, again, piece the puzzles together. Where was he on such and such a date? Where was he for this stretch of time? And mm. that added a lot of work. It was like legwork. Although in the, you know, in the era of the internet where you don't actually have to get up, but it was legwork. Yeah. And I mean, you know, because at first I was very ambitious, like I'm going to go to Detroit. I'm going to go to the hall of records. I'm going to look up this and look up that, but, but then COVID happened. So I'm going, ah, well, okay. not going anywhere, apparently, I, you know, yeah, unless yeah. I'm going to walk there. So I, you know, I had to kind of get around it, but it was, it was like piecing together the story. There was nothing ready made about this at all nothing yeah. it was all pieced together knowing that it's, it's a beautiful thing because it's such a story and you know there's a lot of um there's a lot of detail in there about you know the, the shows themselves you know the crowds that were there and, and what he was doing because he, he was running a promotion as well um right. against something i never knew you know and and being someone like him who was i think yeah so mysterious but so violent in the ring thinking of him running the company that he's working for is, is a really odd thought, you know, how, how did he actually manage to run a business? But it just shows, you know, how right. guys like him were, you know, had those two minds, I suppose. No one knew back then. I mean, he had installed his father-in-law as the mm. figurehead and that's who everybody thought was the boss. And even though it's, it's, it's widely known now, 
There are still old t- I come across still old time fans of Detroit wrestling on Facebook pages and things mm-hmm. that will go the Sheik was the promoter? I don't understand. Still to this day all these years That's later. Amazing. Yeah. Because he had more than one or two screws loose, but no, you know, it just shows you how how much of a genius he was with not only with his character but also his commitment to Cafe. Um, well, yeah, because I think the thing about it is once you once you realize that he was the promoter, hmm. then you understand how he could possibly have been on top for that long, yeah. beating everybody yeah. <laughs> for that long, and then you go, oh, okay, yeah. that's why. Now I understand. Now I get it. Do you, Do you feel that was sort of um, to his detriment that he did that for so long? In the long run, yes. I mean, it worked for a while, but in the long run, it was because mm. he didn't know when to stop. He didn't know when to let go. Now, I, I really believe that, um, you know, he didn't become a huge main event star until he was running his own territory. Mm. And that helped get him to the next level. And then he became a touring attraction, you know, like Andre yeah. the Giant or Dusty Rhodes or somebody like that, just going everywhere. But I feel like Detroit helped him get to the top. But then I think, he didn't he didn't if he wasn't running it anymore if he wasn't the promoter there anymore at that point he could have made a great living just touring the territories going everywhere going to japan making a lot of money you know at that point but he he hung on to detroit for so long and i and you know i don't even mean the company because he only it was only for 16 years which in this history of territories is not very long but he hung on to that top spot to a degree that was beyond anyone else. Like you look at people like Vern Gagne was one in the AWA. Mm. He stepped away finally, you know, in like, yeah. you know, he knew when he, he waited too long, but he did step away. Fritz yeah. von Erich stepped away, let his sons do it. Yeah. Eddie Graham stepped away and he had people like Jack Briscoe and D- Dusty yeah. Rhodes. And, you know, these promoters, they knew and he never trusted. He never made a new top star. You know, he had Bobo Brazil as the top baby face but the Sheik was still the top star yeah. and he never groomed people. If you look at the, the history of the territory and you look at the big matches and the feuds and stuff after a while, it starts, it does start to get very repetitive where yeah. it's this closed circle of, of wrestlers year after year. And every yeah. now and then somebody knew somebody knew and someone leaves, but compared to a lot of other territories, it was a little bit more stagnant. Now it was hot, very hot at the end of the sixties and the early seventies. It had this super hot period, almost like what happened with the Attitude Era, where Mm. it's this explosion of excitement, but then people get tired of it again. And like, and and again, like the Attitude Era, they're seeing the same people and they keep trying to recapture the magic and it's not working and they don't want to try, you know, something truly new. And, and, and it, and it died because of that, because he never really trusted other people enough to, you know, for, there's a lot of reasons, but from the creative point of view, that was the reason. Do you think back then when he was at his height? Because he, he, I saw um, he had shots at the big, the big belts. You know whether it was ever going to come off that he would ever end up with, you know, as NWA Never. champion or WWF champion. Do you think he would have actually, with his persona back then, actually fit on a long term basis with, with, you know, uh, the WWF? I'll say because I mean he was part of the NWA. I understand with big time wrestling, but. And the mainstream, sort of at the top of either of those, do you think he actually had a place that he could have, he he could have stayed somewhere on his own merit rather than putting himself there? You mean after big time wrestling went out of business, or do you mean like either? Really, to be fair, even when he was doing that, and he was because he was still I understand well, you know working with the champions from both, you know would yeah. I think he could have definitely toured, but I just don't think, especially in those days, a person like him wouldn't have been a long-term world champion like i do believe and this is my own personal theory which i explained in the book how i believe that he was being considered as being an interim heel champion in the wwf basically the spot that went to stan stasiak where pedro morales lost the belt and then eight days later they put the belt back on bruno and I think that the Sheik may have been the number one choice for that. And I think he did not want to be booked in that way. And so it became Stan Stasiak. But in actuality, that was probably the best he could hope for. 
he could never be a touring world champion in that time period. Like the NWA was definitely not doing that. I mean, they no. had people like Dory Funk Jr. and Jack Briscoe and, you know, Lou Thez and Pat O'Connor. They're not going to have, like, even though they had some heels like Buddy Rogers and Gene Kaniski, it was nobody to the degree of the Sheik. They, they, no. they would not have people like Sam Muchnick who really took the belt very seriously, they weren't going to put it on somebody like that. And they kind of held their nose even when they booked him. They booked him because they knew that he drew a lot of money. I mean, it was hypocritical. They knew he drew a lot of money, but they still didn't want to give him that top spot, which I think is partly what makes his story extra compelling too, because he knew that. He knew that. He knew that about all of them. So he basically said, you know what? I'm going to create this thing on my own to the point where now you can't deny me. You can't deny me. If you want to make money, you're going to use me. I'm going to use this against you. And I'm going to do something that no one ever does, which I'm going to be the unbeatable heel. Like yeah. that was unheard of at the time. The heel's job is to lose to people. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? It yeah. was the baby face that you would root for like Bruno and they keep winning and winning and winning. <laughs> and with the Sheik, he's like, you know what? I'm going to do that, except I'm going to be a bad guy. But he was smart because he knew that the heels life expectancy was short as a heel. You had to keep moving because you eventually lose and you lose your heat and then you have to go somewhere else or you get buried. And his thinking was, I'm going to be proactive. I am not going to allow that to happen to me. I'm going to beat everybody. (laughs) Very, very. (laughs) So that was the thinking behind it. That was his rationale behind it. And it did give him a lot of longevity for Mm -hmm. a while. I, one thing I do love, just very quickly, I do, I do love about him, that again, you, you find out from this book, is that he was so hated that even when he went against other heels, he turned them into a baby face just because people That's right. didn't want to cheer him. I thought that was brilliant. You know, just, yeah. just literally by being yourself, you can you can put another bag on the wrong side of the tracks. Almost. The feud with Freddie Blassie in California is yeah. like the classic example of that. Blassie had been hated for years in California, years. And the thing is, Blassie didn't even change anything about himself no. or his style or his persona. They just said, you know what? This guy's better than the Sheik. We're, we, we, we're going to root <laughs> for the Sheik. And there were other examples, too, where I forget. the name, But, I mean, he would be wrestling these just reprehensible people. Mm. And the crowd would chant for, the crowd would cheer for the other yeah. guy against yeah. him, no matter who it was, no matter who it was. Yeah. So um, you can't deny, even though many of us, uh, I'll count myself in this, I'm, I'm guessing there's others out there that didn't really know much about his history and his story. You can't deny the blueprint he left behind. Um, I know he didn't have trademark over the, the Middle Eastern gimmick, but you know, the Iron Sheik, obviously you mentioned it as well. When people think of the Sheik, you think of the Iron Sheik. I must admit, I did it for a lot of years as well. Sure. Um, but he brought us um, Sabu and Rob Van Dam. You know, just two of the guys that um, that he trained. Would probably putting you on the spot a little bit here, but from what you know and what he's done and what he's left behind, would things like ECW have existed uh, or would become what they did without that nucleus of Sabu and Rob Van Dam that the Sheik gave us? It's interesting you put it that way, because I thought you were going to say, would ECW have existed without the Sheik? And my gut reaction is to say yes, because you can't. I mean, even though the Sheik was influential in developing the hardcore style, you can't ever tie it to just one person. I mean, there were a lot of people, Abdullah the Butcher, Wild Bull Curry, Danny McShane. There were there were a lot of like wild brawlers that, you know, even even Terry Funk. But when you talk about Sabu, even more than Rob Van Dam. That's an interesting proposition because Mm. Sabu was the undertaker of ECW. He Mm. was like the special, unique attraction that was bigger than the title. Heyman knew that. He Mm. really knew that. He made him his unique, like his Andre the Giant, whatever you want to call it, his special thing. And I, yeah, you know, it played a huge part in making that company successful. And that was a result of the Sheik, not just training him, but giving him the persona, giving him the um, dedication to the character and that kind of thing. So 
yeah, I mean, I think you could make a case that the Sheik's influence via Sabu did play a big part in ECW's success. Interesting thesis. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. Cool. Um, listen, Brian, this has been fantastic, mate. I, I, um, I've, I've been in awe, really, of, of talking with you, not only about what you've done before, but this book really has. I've read a lot. I've said it recently. I've read a lot of fantastic books this year. A um, couple behind me, and, uh, you know, other guys that I've had on the show. But this one really did open my eyes. And I think, again, leaving me with the sense of this was a story that I didn't realise that I had to know um you know it's testament to how good that is you know thank you with the challenges that you faced in order to get this out there so everyone watching listening to this go out and get this uh, you know any wrestling fan out there i think they've already be getting it anyway because it's just one of those things i think especially history fans like myself um as soon as there is a story out there that we can dig our teeth into we snap it up but uh but yeah blood and fire the unbelievable real life of wrestling's original chic out there i got it on amazon um it's out there i would imagine other places as well yeah yeah everywhere it's it's barnesandnoble.com and you know even in in some physical bookstores if you could find them i've seen it in there i also for people that might be interested i have um autographed copies as well i still have a handful left i try to keep in supply of them from the publisher but you know they, they go quickly but if anybody would want one um they can reach me at brian r solomon at yahoo.com that's my email address so if they want to reach out and you know we can discuss terms but i do sell autographed copies as well brilliant awesome you never know one day i'll post this out to you you can sign this one send it back Just yeah be happy to. <laughs> sure cool i'm going to leave you with one final question um and this is one that I, I had fun with last year with a lot of my guests uh, when it became a bit of a bit of a staple at the end. And I haven't asked it for a while, but I'm really intrigued on your take. Uh, quite simply, if you had your own wrestling Mount Rushmore, who would you have on it? Ah, the old Mount Rushmore yeah, question. <laughs> why not? Everyone's got their own. I liked, I'm intrigued. It's, it's almost impossible because there's, so, first of all, there's so many. But second of all, wrestling has changed so much over the eras. And I try to give very equal attention to different eras because in what happens so often with this Mount Rushmore thing, or even when people do top tens, it's always just what I remember, what yeah. I know, what from a time that I was a fan, I try not to do that. I really, I really try to, because I study the history of wrestling and go, now I wasn't around when all the presidents on Mount Rushmore were around, <laughs> but I recognize that they deserve yeah. to be there. So let me do the same thing for wrestling. And I've thought about the question and it changes sometimes over time. Sure. But if you're pushing me right now, I would say um, <sighs> Frank Gotch, Jim Londis, Luthes and Hulk Hogan. Well, I'm always I'm always intrigued, you know, whether Hogan, particularly one, will make it on a lot of these. Um, he's he's not on mine, although and, I can't, you know, well, I, I you can't deny what he did, you know, right? You know, he helped. It, well, some of those four stuff. guys on Mount Rushmore too. If we're going by all that stuff, we might want to blow up their faces too. But we leave them there, right? So for Ho you know, so I'm looking at just the accomplishments. For me, the reason Hogan's there is because you could make a very real argument that he was the single biggest star in the history of professional wrestling. You can make a very real argument. I think you could also possibly make that argument for Jim Londis here in the United States. He was the top draw for many, many years. Frank Gotch was a national celebrity. I think people don't realize that. Luthez is probably my shakiest of the four because I mean he was a he was a long running undisputed world heavyweight champion at a very prominent time in wrestling. But I could also see somebody like Gorgeous George being there. Mm. I could see um, um, I don't want to say San Martino because he was a little more regional. I know people will hate me for saying yeah. that, but I could also see potentially Ed Strangler Lewis being there. So I have like some alternates, you know. Okay. 
yeah, yeah. that's cool for di- under different sort of headings if you had different right. ones i probably right. got that you know i've got the ones who should be there a bit like you really for you know what i feel their contributions were and i've got mine for just popularity wise what i feel are my favorites sort of thing. right so, oh that yeah that would be a little different different right? exactly yeah, yeah. Uh, brian again thank you so so much this has been an absolute pleasure talking to you all the best with the book um you know any anything else in the works uh not to kind of stray from the one that's out you know newly out there at the moment anything else that you've got going on that you you can come and tell us about sure well i have a podcast of my own i started in february um it's part of the arcadian vanguard uh, podcast network which carries of course the jim cornett uh experience his shows and the 605 super podcast uh my podcast is called shut up and wrestle <laughs> and you'd like it because it's old school themed we cool. don't e- even though i still do follow the current product and i write about it mm. Um, it's strictly old school topics. I have rotating guests. So what I talk about depends on who the guest is. Like I just had, um, baby doll on who was a manager in Crockett promotions in the eighties and a valet. So we got to talk about that. And my next one is I'm having someone that people probably don't even know. Who's one who was my editor at WWE and raw magazine, Mike Fazioli. I try to do that because I know these people and no one else is doing this to have Titan tower ex employees on to talk about what it was like working there. So I do that uh, on shut up and wrestle as far as um, books. I I have some things that I'm considering what to do next. I don't want to give too many details unless somebody, you know, in case somebody rips me off, but one is something related to the history of pro wrestling magazines, which again, has never really been done. Yeah. And the and uh, that's so there wouldn't really be a biography. But if I do something on the biography front, I do have two very strong possibilities in mind. But again, I don't want to say in case somebody hears this and goes, I'm going to do that one <laughs> first. So I'm not going to say they've got the time to do it. So I do. Yeah. 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 Cool. Brilliant. Cool. I'll uh, I'll definitely uh, be keeping an eye on all that. I will check your podcast out as well because that sounds yeah right up my street. So uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Brian. All the best with everything, mate. Hopefully, speak again. Another You're time. very welcome. Yes, and I hope we speak again as well. Cool. Thank you, mate. Thank you for listening to a Nerd to Know Media production.